Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to our students online as well. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer and we'll get into our session. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, that even as we've been learning about our identity and what you have called us to be, Lord, we pray that uh, we will truly just grow deeper and know our identity, grow into the things of God, into, into greater spiritual uh, spiritual realms of God. I pray for your wisdom, Lord, even as we study. May your grace be upon us, Lord. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. All right. All right, so we're getting into the next section uh, in our notes. Uh, if you've been tracking along, we last class we finished um, quite a few chapters. We did 18, 19, uh, growing old things have passed away. We did chapter 20, all things are new from God. And then 21 was quite important because we talked about growing into the measure of God. You know, we looked about the natural and the spiritual. In the natural, we know what a five-year-old can do and what a 25-year-old can do. Right? That's growing into what he has to do. So in the spiritual also, God wants us to grow into what he wants us to be. That is what? Christ-likeness. So basically, the full measure of our spiritual growth is when we are walking in the same measure that Jesus walked while he was on earth. That's what we want to become like. Who is our role model? Jesus, right? not Apostle uh, Peter and Paul. They're all wonderful. Right? But our role model is Jesus. The role model is not pastor uh, in your church. Apostle, they are not your role models. You can look up to them. You can get encouragement from them. They are there to support and strengthen and be there. But our identity is, hey, I want to be like Jesus. right? And that's how we grow spiritually. Right. Let's get into justified, that is made righteous in Christ. Now, the word made righteous, uh, you know, we've used this many times, right? Justified is just as if. We have not sinned, which means without any blame. Right? Uh, how many of you know of the blame game? You know, they say they say that blame game, right? We, we blame each other. No, because of this, I did this. Or because of that person, I did this. Who did the first blaming in the Bible? Adam. Because the woman you gave me, I didn't ask for it. I didn't ask for her. You gave me that woman. Adam tried to blame God. Right? So it was there. That nature is there. Right? Many believers, my, many of us, we feel unworthy. We feel guilty. We feel shameful. We feel condemned. We feel, okay, this is how my life is going to be. But the Bible teaches us that as believers, we are just as if we have not sinned, we are without blame. Now, I want you to think about this not in the natural sense, right? Always remember the scriptures is both the natural and the spiritual. If you read the book of Proverbs, there's a lot of things that talks about the natural things that we have to do, wisdom and uh, how to go after wisdom, knowledge and all of it. But here, we must understand that God is talking about our identity, right? And he's saying, this is what I see you. You may not see yourself as that, right? Uh, you know, you look at these professional athletes, right? Their coaches will say, some, some of them have some good coaches. Some of them have coaches who can put the, their athletes down, right? So there was this... Uh, there's this coach who can say, you know, hey, you cannot do anything. You know, we practice so much and now, you know, you've come, we've not even come third place. You've come fifth or sixth. What is this? You know, we practice for so many hours. That's one kind of a coach. And then you have another kind of a coach who can say, don't worry. Two years down the line, you can win. You can at least come in the top three. And then four years down the line, you can be the best. You can be a gold medalist. And then five years down the line, you can break the world record. Now, what is the difference here? When a person says to uh, an athlete, see, you're not able to do this, what 
it discourages them there's guilt there's condemnation right and here you've got somebody who has failed but the coach is saying hey, you can do it don't look at now two years down the line you'll be a champion now when jesus is looking at us he's not looking at us now how we are right he's looking at us as his children and how we can be remember the example of peter right we talked about that and jesus say hey you're a fisherman the least you could do is just you know be there for me but you are not there jesus didn't say that he said peter are you ready to take on the church are you ready to take on the ministry so he sees us what we can be right god however he identifies us as new creation where he himself has put his spirit into us and he has moved us from darkness to light and he has brought us near he has we talked about all of this right we were far away because of sin now he has brought us near he's calling us his children i'll give you this example this is a story that i read but it's a very powerful story i read it in uh, an article many years back there was an eagle right and this eagle mother eagle had a nest it was it had laid eggs and had a nest right everyone understand what a nest is right that laid the eggs and right down under there was a big chicken farm so one day there was a you know heavy breeze and one of those eggs fell into the chicken farm so the mother egg didn't realize it okay now the eggs hatched there were chickens and there was this eagle eaglet so all the chickens used to keep saying hey you're very different look at us we are white but you're brown color right look at us how we are the way you sound is different we sound different but the eaglet always said no 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 i'm i'm your brother only we're all the same right so the eaglet believed it and was growing growing in the same place where the chicks are the eagle eaglet believe that is a chicken what do chickens do it eats from the ground right chickens don't fly chickens have small wings but eagles are not meant for that if you look at you know if you've seen uh national geography and all these you know eagles have the capacity to kill whole deers with their horns deers crocodiles and they're so strong their, their their paws are so strong now this eagle is believing it's a chicken so what happens is now this is an illustration okay it's so uh, 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 one day one eagle was flying and it came and stopped on tree just to take some rest and started and looked down and saw there were a lot of chicks there and one of the eaglets was there uh, the eagle is growing so this other eagle comes and says hey what are you doing with the chickens the eagle says no 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 i'm a chicken no you're not a chicken you're an eagle see we both have the same kind of wings we both have the same kind of beak we look the same only thing you're too small but when you grow you be big you'll have wings like me why don't you try to fly but now this eagle the small baby eagle doesn't know that it can fly eagles can fly above the clouds yes or no they fly the highest but this doesn't know say yeah, i'm a chick i'm a chick i'm a chicken i'll become a chicken so then this other, this eagle said you come with me i'll show you and taught this eaglet how to fly and the eaglet realized hey i'm not i don't belong here i don't belong with the chicks i belong on top over the over the clouds i fly on top i'm the king of the bird family that's what i am but it was behaving like a chick now what is so significant about this story right now i'm not saying we are chickens and eagles or what i'm trying to say is our identity people can tell us hey this is what you are you're a chicken you deserve to you you know you only have to do these small things but god is saying hey you're an eagle now the choice is whether we want to be a chicken or an eagle you know, 
all through the scriptures, God talks about the power of the eagle, right? The identity of who you are, right? So many times the devil can come and say, hey, no, you, you are only a chicken. It may be you're living with the chickens, but you're an eagle. You change your identity, change your thinking, right? Does this story make sense, right? So one of the things I keep telling, you know, my little boy came and said, you know, some boys teased me in school. They, they were making fun of me in school. I said, hey, I keep telling him every single day, you're an eagle, you're a lion. That's what you are. So then he went back and, you know, a couple of days back, his friends teased him. And he said, hey, I'm an eagle. I said, eagles don't be with the crows. Eagles fly on top flight. They're high above. That's what you are. So he keeps telling himself, I'm an eagle. You tell yourself, hey, I'm an eagle. I'm a lion. That's what my identity is. That's what God sees me. I may see myself as somebody very small, but God sees me as an eagle. Right? Ephesians 1.4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Look at this verse. Just as he chose us in him. Say he chose us. That, but we accepted Jesus. But the moment he chose us, once we are in Christ, what does he have? That we should be holy and without blame with him in love. Even before the foundations of the world, God determined to have a family of people. God determined to have the church. He determined everything before the foundation of the world. Right? So it was not like uh, God was worried after Adam sinned. No, no. Everything was done before the foundation of the world. He had decided it. There was a plan. It was already in, uh, you know, it was already kept there. Only thing he waited for many years to do it, but the plan was already there. The words without blame simply means faultless, blameless, unblameable, without any blemish or spot. Now, what is the word blemish? You have a white T-shirt. Some of you are wearing white T-shirts. Imagine you take a, you know, a, a ink pen, right? A red or a blue ink pen, and this and that mark comes there. Is it going to go? You can sit and scrub it the whole day, buy all kinds of things, and don't try it. <laughs> you can buy all kinds of detergents and uh, all those things. It will not go easily. It's a blemish. Which will be there? Yes or no? Right. So we have the gospel. In in what Jesus is saying is, when I see you, when you are in Christ, there is no blemish. Is there sin? In, is there some? Do we sin? Do we do things wrong? Yes. But when Jesus sees us, there's no blemish. There's no spot. You know, the scriptures say, He has washed our sins away, whiter than snow. Right? If you've seen snow, it's so white, whiter than snow. Then he says, I've, I've forgotten about your sins. You ask for forgiveness, it's done, it's forgotten. I'm not even thinking about it. It's like, you know, when we pray, we say, Jesus, actually, you know what, two weeks back, I, may, I did a sin. When two weeks back? No, actually, in the morning, no, I was uh, getting angry and I did some. That's a big sin that I made. Jesus, I don't remember. Okay, forget it. You understand what I'm saying? He chooses not to remember it. Forgets it. Because he looks at us as blameless. Now, this does not give an op us an opportunity to keep sinning and saying, God, anyway you choose to forgive. No. Right? We looked at the verse in, in the book of Hebrews. If we keep on sinning, there's no more sacrifice that is needed because the cross has done everything. It's not. Uh, it's not a... It's not the identity of a believer to keep on sinning, right? Colossians chapter 1, 20 and 22. 20, 21 and 22. Let's read that. Maybe one of us. Yes, please. And by he reconciled all things to himself. 
by him whatever things on earth or things in heaven having made peace through the blood of his cross and you who once were alliance and enemies in your mind by wicked works yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh throne that to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight yeah so we were once enemies with god now because of the cross we are friends with god now look at that word reconcile right how many of you in school you had a best friend okay all of us would have had some kind of a best friend right and you had an argument with your best friend right so i am not talking to you your friends for many years but you had an argument i'm not talking to you it could be because of a pencil or rubber They're small kids right no you know i'm not talking to you and so when you go home how is your heart i don't know if it's happened to you but you know, how did he do this one side you're feeling sad one side you're you know i lost my good friend simply we fought now now one side and the other side we want to patch things up but uh, he should say sorry first he has, he he did the mistake right? the next day we go to school we see the fellow your best friend he is you look away but your heart is hey without him it's boring he's my best friend yes or no and then suddenly one day maybe the second day you say hey i can't manage this so you say okay can you give me one book that one sentence what's happened become best friends <laughs> back, back to normal right and then what has happened they have reconciled now their friendship has become even closer are they going to talk about why they fought very unlikely they'll not talk about it right so that's what jesus did adam was a friend of god so picture this the bible says in genesis god was walking in the garden so two friends are walking god and abraham and adam so maybe Ad, uh, god is telling adam see this is what you call plants when you put the seed in this this is what you call seed you put the seed inside the ground then i will make it grow but once it's growing you have to put water this is called water how did, how did adam know all of this god taught him god walked with adam they were like friends talking after sin what happened separation but after the cross that friendship was back. after the cross it was reconciled and now he's brought us closer than before who has a better relationship with god adam or you and me who do you think we yeah why because the spirit of god who is god is inside us any time we can go to god anywhere any place we can go to god he has reconciled best friends now will you go to your friends hey hey can i talk to you for one minute please will you say that to your best friend we have languages that we can use right we have those friendly words that we say hey come here man i want to tell you something you know, it's very casual but we're not talking about being very casual with god but the thing is our reconciliation has happened you're not fearful to go back to god right the words here you also see the word above reproach which means unaccused nobody can accuse what is the meaning of satan meaning of satan satan means accuser thank you get it satan means accuser of the brethren his job is to accuse that's what he is you did this you did this you did this accuser of the brethren he comes to kill steal and destroy that's his work right but jesus is saying when I, when you are my child you are unaccused without any reproach i'm not going to accuse you of anything are there sins that we need to ask forgiveness for yes but i'm still not going to accuse you of it once it's forgiven it's forgiven it's done it's gone it's not going to think of it again 
right? How does God view you, and what what do you think God thinks about you? This is something that you can write down. Think about it. What do you think God thinks of me? God, I'm not able to pray one hour a day. So you think God's love is reduced? Oh, wow. Is it, do you think okay, God? Uh, you know, I'm not uh, in full time ministry. Is God's love reduced? No, it's still the same. Right? It is the same. It will never change. So when we understand that, hey, God loves me no matter what, uh, we will change. Things in our lives will change. The way we look at situations, the way we look at people, the way we look at ourselves will change. Amen? Right? So we have to do it. God has done it. All we have to do is believe it. Right? Let's go to the next one. We are accepted in the beloved. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6. What is the meaning of accepted? Right? The phrase he has, let's read that uh, Ephesians 1 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Everyone say accepted. accepted. And you all had applied for Bible college. What happened? You were, you, I think you would have also got an acceptance letter or an email. Right. Okay, you are accepted into the Bible college. Right. Now Jesus says, Every time you pray, the moment, the day you pray and say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, make me a new person, you have made the salvation prayer. Jesus gives you an acceptance certificate. Yeah, you are accepted in the beloved. Now, you are not accepted into a Bible college. You are accepted into heaven. You are accepted into his presence. Right? You see that? Accepted in the beloved literally means he, he gives you great honor. To be highly favored, he covers us with grace. Can you believe this? Jesus is giving us honor. We are supposed to give Jesus honor, no? Right? We sing glory and honor, power belongs to you, Jesus. But Jesus is saying, I will honor you. Jesus is honoring us. You may think, oh, Jesus, it's okay. You don't have to. I mean, I'm not doing much for you. We feel that, no, at times, I'm not able to do much for you not able to you know i want to do so much i want to touch many lives start a church start a ministry i want to you know be impactful for the kingdom of god i'm not able to do anything what is the honor in that but jesus is saying the day you have accepted me i've already favored you you're highly favored i have already honored you and i will keep honoring you i will not look at your works i will look at you as my child Right? It's like this. Imagine a student, a, a father and a son, right? Or daughter, anyone. If the child writes his exams, right? He writes his final exam, he gets 60%. Right? The parents are saying, okay, good. You got 60%. Do well next time. Try to get better. Now, if the child doesn't do well the second unit test or the next test, and he gets a lower percentage. Will the parents uh, say, get out of the house? You got worse marks than last time. Last time I kept quiet. This time you got lesser. Don't come back home. Go. Till you get 90%. Don't. Will the parents say that? Parents will correct and say, hey, you've been playing too much. You're giving your interests are on other things. Study, finish your exams, do better in what you're doing. Simple. But, but the parent, will the parents say no food for the next two days? No. They'll still make the food. They'll still you know, keep him at home and everything will be normal. Why? Because he's already accepted. He's already there. He's already part of the family. And whether he passes or he fails, he's accepted in the family. Right? And that's what Jesus is saying. You and I are accepted into the family. Doesn't matter about our works. Now there are there are rewards, right? Now if a father says to a son, "You get eighty percent in your final exam, I'll get you a cycle." Now this boy works very hard. Right? 
sacrifices. He gets 80%. The father buys him a cycle. It's a reward. Right? Now, if he doesn't get 80%, no cycle, you will get one chocolate, eat it, be happy. The father is not going to say, go away from me. No. Right? You understand the concept. In the natural itself, if parents are so loving, will not God the Father be even more loving to us? He will. Right? Here he says that he made us objects of his grace. Right? So you are not hated. You are not accused. You are not shamed. You are not contempt, uh, condemned. In Christ, you are loved, accepted, you are honored, you are favored. Right? So tell this to yourself. All the people around you may hate you, but God loves you. All the people around you may say you cannot do anything in life, but God says you're highly favored. I will make you a blessing. Look at the people who God chose in the Old Testament. Look at the New Testament. Who are the people God chose? Were there some great people? Peter, what was he doing? Catching fish. Matthew, tax collector. The Old Testament, Moses. He says, no, 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 I can't, I can't do it. I can't talk. You send somebody else. Joseph, David, simple people. David, he took a shepherd boy, a shepherd to be the king of Israel. Daniel, right? He made Daniel be the governor of Babylon for three consecutive kings. So many years. He uses simple people and makes them great. Yes? Right? So don't look at, hey, I'm from a village. I don't know this. I don't know that. No. Say, hey, this is what God is saying. I'm not hated, I'm not condemned, I'm not accused. God can do big things in my life. I just have to depend on God. People will say, you can't do. You say, I can do. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things. Everyone say, all things. My little one says, oh, oh dad, maths is very difficult. What is this maths? I say, what is Philippians 4.13? Oh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, he's... Uh, these are words that we need to speak to ourselves. Right? And this may be too good to be true, but when we embrace, when we receive it, when we say, this is who I am, our thinking and our lifestyle will change. Right? Now, there could be th this religious stronghold causes us to uh, you know causes us to enjoy emotional self flagellation which means we we tell ourselves right that we are not good we keep telling ourselves we keep speaking words of you know condemnation upon ourselves right we whip ourselves emotionally telling ourselves how unfit we are we are unworthy we are not able to People will tell us, and then we'll tell ourselves. You know, growing up, I remember uh, I wanted to learn the guitar. How to learn guitar? I can't go for guitar classes. During those days, there was no very few people to learn guitar. And I didn't even have a guitar. So what to do? I should watch people. I just always think, oh, man, it's too much. I cannot do this. What are, it, it's too much of effort and we can't do it. And I thought to myself, if I say I can't do it, what will happen? If I say I can't do it, I can't do it. So then I took step number one. I had a ruler in my house. Right? I, like, not a ruler, but a wooden stick, long one, which my mother used to whack me with. So I used to take that stick and play guitar under the mirror okay long stick play the guitar there's no guitar at home well, you know play all the songs whatever song you want to learn you learn under the mirror right and then my parents thought i was mad 
because I was just doing that the whole day. But what happened? Practice. Practice is happening. Then suddenly my brother said, I'll buy you a guitar. So he bought me a guitar under the mirror. This became easy, right hand movement. Because for more than one year, I was playing with a stick. So this was no problem, only this was a problem now. So start practicing. I said, look, okay, one day I will stand on the stage. What am I playing here? Nothing, only sound. But over time, I kept telling myself, we can do it. There's no excuse. We can do it. If God wants me to, if he wants to use me, if he wants to do uh, work through me, and if he has a plan, he's seeing me as somebody who can do it. People will say, no, you say you can. Over time, now that involved a lot of, now nobody came and said, you know, the Holy Spirit didn't say, you play the G chord like this and then D chord like this. No. Okay. We learned it ourselves. We took the effort, right? We took the pain. We took the trouble, you know, of practicing and the fingers get cut. And it pains. You can't even touch something initially. It pains. All of that we have to go through. Right? It's not like drinking a uh, magic potion. Drink it. Oh, now I'm a guitarist. No, it's effort. Right? So when people and when we ourselves tell that we can't do, that's what will happen. But if we stay, tell ourselves we can do, then we can do. Amen? Right? We can do. I remember going to Central, uh, APC Central, where you all go right now. So during those days, we used to meet in another place. And I used to stand way back in the balcony, and I used to watch the worship team. So, wow. You know, during those days, there were no LED screen. It was just a regular auditorium. But I used to watch the worship team. What are they doing? How are they playing so well? How are they playing? Everything sounding so nice. How are they doing this? So every Sunday I have to go and watch. I say, God, one day, one day, can I, will I get a chance? Right? Will you give me a door open? Will you give me a chance to be here? Now, just because I pray, it doesn't mean that we go back home and relax. I knew there's a lot of effort. I knew that I had to learn. And about four or five years later, I got the opportunity. Right? And God just opened the door. We were able to, you know, lead worship. And there's so much that I learned right, over those years, so many years of leading worship. Right? And initially, I thought to myself, how will I do this? All these musicians are so good. But if God wants, if God desires, and you have the right desire, he can do it. If you desire to see yourself standing in front of the stage with thousands of people listening to you preach, that's a good desire. But what must we do for that? Everyone say preparation time. Again, preparation time is never wasted. So if you have to stand on the, in front of the mirror and play with a stick, do it. If you have to stand in front of the mirror and keep preaching the word for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, do it. It's never a wasted time. The devil, as you're preparing, the devil will come and say, Oh, what are you preparing for all this? God, you can't do this. This is not what you, God is calling you for. You tell the devil, I know what I am. I know what God can do. So I'm not going to listen to you. Right now I'm in my room, but one day will come. I will stand in front of people and minister the gospel, right? We are created, created to be loved. We are created uh, to be purposeful, to be hopeful. And don't let the devil feel, make us feel down. A feeling of rejection will come. A feeling of sadness, difficulties will come. I'm not saying once we become believers, life is very smooth. No, there are many ups and downs. But through that all, we continue to know our identity. Look at uh, David. What a wonderful example, no? When he was probably 12 or 13 years old, he was anointed the king of Israel. After that, what he had to do? He had to run away. 
everyone said oh david wonderful saul killed thousands david killed ten thousands they carried him on his shoulder david was enjoying the success next chapter is running why saul is behind him where he's running he has to go he's running in the caves he's hiding himself and david said oh, i thought you're going to make me king but i'm sure david would have looked at himself not as a shepherd boy that day when saul uh, uh, samuel would have anointed him his mindset would have changed his mind would have been i'm not a shepherd now i am a king of israel now well, what is the king of israel, future king of israel doing looking at after the sheep come this side don't go the side that's what he's doing but he's looking at himself as hey one day i'll be on the throne and did it happen it happened after how many years more than 17 years but there was seasons and challenges that he took david through same thing with moses same thing with uh, you know uh, uh, Apostle Paul, Joseph, same thing. Right. Uh, Joseph, what's the story there? Joseph, uh, uh, God, you said my brothers will bow down to me. Here I'm sitting in the prison. Right. They're all persecuting me. False accusations against me. But I'm sure Joseph would have thought, no, one day that dream will come true. Right now I'm in the prison. One day that dream will come true. Did it come true? Did the brothers bow down for, before him? How many years? 17 years. Many ups and downs. right? But when God says something, he will accomplish it. But we need to be faithful to every season. In every season, we need to be faithful. Let's go to uh, the next chapter. Washed, sanctified, and justified. Let's read that portion. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteousness uh, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be de deceived. Deceived, neither forni fornicators, fornicators, nor idol idol idolaters, idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor Sodomites, Sodomites, North, North thieves, North thieves, North loads, nor covetous, nor nor drunkards, nor drunkards, nor revelers, revels, extortioners, extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some if you, but you were washed. But you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus mm. and by the Spirit of our God. Mm. Now, this is uh, First Corinthians. You know, Paul is being a little stern. Yes or no? It's okay. Don't feel bad. It's all right. These are difficult words, right? Yeah, it's all right. Right. So these Paul is writing, and he's saying, "What's he saying?" He's being a little stern now. He's saying, see, do you not know that those who are living unrighteous life will not inherit the kingdom of God? What is this unrighteousness? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters. You know what is fornication? Fornication means involving in sex before marriage. That's for fornicators, right? Idolaters, idol worship, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, there's a whole list. These people will not inherit the kingdom of God. And some of you were like that. And Paul is saying, when I came and met you in Corinth, you all were all this, you all were idolaters, you all were worshipping idols, you all were living in sexual immorality, you all were living as sinners, you all were thieves, you all were doing all these things. Some of you were like that, but now you are Everyone say washed, sanctified, justified. Three things. Washed, sanctified. You were all of that. But now you are washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus through the Spirit of God. So 
Paul is reminding them that's your identity. Your previous identity was that whole list, idolatry, morality, all of those things. Now you're washed, sanctified, justified. Right? The Corinthian believers were had a very uh, notorious background. Right? So let me give you a background. There was a temple called Aphrodite. There were thousand male prostitutes, thousand female prostitutes. Right? This was a goddess of infertility, goddess of fertility. Right? So prostitution was a good thing because the the god was a god goddess of fertility, and there was idol worship. Sex outside of marriage, sex out, uh, before marriage, sexual immorality, all of this was common in that place. Now, these people are coming to the church, they become believers. Paul is saying, Don't think of your past. Once you become believers, your identity has changed. This is behind us, it is not there now, it's not in the present. This is not who you are today. That's what Paul is telling the believers. Now, if we translate it to us, were we sinners? Did we live in sin? Did we sin in our life? Yes. But now, when Jesus looks at us, he says, that is your past. Don't go back to your past. Right? Go back. Go look at the future. Look at what you can be. Right? The Apostle Paul calls out who they are today that is washed, sanctified, justified we are washed we are made clean all our dirt all our filth is removed right now it is our choice god has removed the filth god has removed dirt if i say no i like filth i like to go and sit in the dirt what is it that means it means it's our choice god will say so for example there is a clean swimming pool and there is a dirty swimming pool and you're getting ready to swim. Where, which one you'll go to? Why? Because it's clean. But what if one person says, no, I'll go to the dirty swimming pool. What will you tell him? Go. You'll tell him, see, this is clean. You can swim here. Your body also will be clean. It's clean. Why you want to go to the dirty swimming pool? And No, I want to go to the dirty swimming pool. Okay, go. And that's what, that's what God will say. say. I have an option for you. Option A, I made you clean. But you're saying, no, I want option B. I want to go and sit in the dirty swimming pool, in the slush, in the dirt, in the filth. And God will say, see, I have a better option. You're not taking it. It's up to you. But whenever you want, you can come to this pool. It's open. It's ready. You understand what I'm saying? Right? So he gives us the choice. Justified is acquitted, declared not guilty, no more charges. So if you look at a court setting, uh, if, a, if somebody is a murderer and you know the murderer's brother comes and says, I'll take up the, the penalty of life sentence, then this fellow, the real murderer, is just as if he has not sinned. He can go out, he can walk out of that court, Go back to his home and live a normal life. People will say, hey, you're the murderer. Say, yeah, I'm the murderer, but my brother's taking, taken up my space. So now I'm free. The cops cannot come and say, you are the murderer, you should be in prison. Even if the cops come and say, yeah, but my brother's taken up my place. Just an example, right? So free. The, there are two New Testament words we need to be familiar with justified and righteousness. Uh, I'm sure all of us have heard of this word, no? What is justified? Is to be declared not guilty, right? What is righteous? When we are standing... Right standing with God. Yeah, right standing before God. Righteous, right standing before God. Justified? And right, justification and righteousness go hand in hand. They're two sides of a coin, right? They, they go hand in hand. Just because you're justified, you have a right standing before God. And you have a right standing before God because you are justified. If we have sin, 
right? If we have not accepted the Lord Jesus, then we won't have a right standing before God because we are not yet justified, right? You see, on both sides, it is the same. To be justified is to be made uh, righteous. So both words are synonymous, right? So we'll, we'll stop here. Uh, because we have only a few minutes, but I don't want to get into the next chapter. We'll, we'll pick up from next week. Right. So everyone are understanding this, right? Uh, it's very important for us as believers, right, to tell ourselves, speak to ourselves, no matter what it is, right? Um, you may see in the natural happening. Remember Abraham and Sarah? Right? In the natural, what is it? The, the, her womb was barren. It was too. She was too old. But Abraham believed in God. Right? Remember, God told him, Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Abraham would have said, "Give me one. I don't want nations. Give me one son. Enough. I don't even have my own son." But he believed that when God told him, "I believed it." Then 15 years later, he's worried. Oh, where, where is the sun? Where is the promise, God? So God told Abraham, Abraham, you come out from your tent. Come out. You look up at the stars. So he looks up. You see the stars in the sky? You can't count them. That many will be your descendants. Again, faith. And I said, oh, God has still remembers his promise. He has not forgotten me. Sometimes we may feel God has forgotten us. A simple person in a simple place, nobody knows me. Even if some, if I'm admitted in the hospital, nobody will know. Even if I'm not in this world, nobody will know. No, don't think that way. Every person here is valuable before God. People may not know, but God knows. Right? So all, all that you have to do is speak. Speak what God wants you to be. Keep speaking it. Keep telling yourself, God, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to see myself. This is where I want to be. If you if you're you know probably learning some instruments, right? You're learning, you want to learn an instrument and you feel, how will I learn? I'm not good enough. You tell yourself, God, I want to do this. Help me, help me to understand, help me to learn. Give me get people into my life who can help me and teach me. There was this, you know, I'll close with this. There was this young boy uh, who had attended our Bible college, and he would always come up to this is many years back, I think 20, 2015 or 2014, I think, 14 of 2015 batch. It's a young boy, right? And uh, he would come up to me and he'd say, oh, Pastor, I want to be a good translator. I want to translate from English to his native language. So very good. He knew he wanted to be preacher in his language, and he wanted to be like a main translator. So what he would do, he would practice and practice and practice. I, I remember him so clearly because he had his table. He had four Bibles with him. He would leave them all open on the table, and he would uh, he would sit alone on the table. So he had a English to Hindi, English. Easy to read version, English hard, uh, the NKJV, the, the difficult version, and he's got a full Hindi Bible. Oh, books everywhere. After the class, he'll come up to me. What is this meaning? Every time, what is this meaning? What is it? Uh, one dictionary next to him, big ones. And he graduated and he went. A couple of years later, he sends me these videos, clips. And in those clips, he's translating in front of thousands of people. Right? And great men and women of God, he's translating. He's standing and he's translating from English to another language, to his native language. He's saying, God did it faster. God has opened so many doors. People are willing to pay him to come and translate because he's doing so well, right? So never look at what it is now. Look at what it is years down the line. Look at what God calls you.
right? All right, thank you so much. Uh, have a great weekend also, and I'll see you on Monday. God bless. God bless. Thank you very much, Bev. God bless.